I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Pastors have a tendency to exaggerate when it comes to numbers, especially with their colleagues. Picture this, a group of pastors are having lunch together on a Tuesday talking about the state of their congregations. One of them asks another, how many did you have out on Sunday? Oh, we had to have 225, comes the reply. And then Morgan Freeman comes in as the narrator to say, he said there were 225, but the pastor was wrong. There were actually only 63 people there on Sunday. Another pastor will ask a colleague, what's your average attendance for your midweek program? Oh, we get a hundred easy, I'd say. And again, Morgan Freeman narrates, but 100 was just a symbolic number. It's not just pastors who do this, right? If you're a widget maker and I ask you how many widgets you make on a day in your assembly line, you're maybe going to know a precise number or you might just round it up to make it seem impressive. Rarely are numbers rounded down unless we're talking about sensitive matters like government deficits or perhaps one's weight. A few months ago, I went in for my physical and the nurse put me on the scale and I mentioned that my scale at home came in a couple of pounds lower than the one in the doctor's office and she said, let's just go with your number. Numbers always have meaning, but depending on your line of work and your personality, those numbers may be precise or they may be more general or symbolic. And we've seen this throughout our study in Revelation, haven't we? Uh, we saw it especially last week as we looked at the last part of chapter 13 and saw that ominous number, 666, the mark of the beast. And we learned how many people have sought to determine the precise meaning of that number, sometimes with tunnel vision that allows them to think about nothing else, including matters of faith that most might deem to be more important. And today, we're going to look at another controversial number, one that we've actually seen before. That number is the number 144,000. You may recall that we saw this number back in Revelation chapter 7, but there's a reasonable probability that you don't recall that. So let's quickly revisit Revelation 7. In chapter 7, John's vision notes that there were 144,000 people who were marked with the seal of God from the tribes of Israel, but not the standard 12 tribes, right? There were 12,000 from each of 11 tribes, 11 of the 12. The one that's missing, interestingly enough, is the tribe of Dan. And there were 12,000 from the half-tribe of Manasseh, who was one of Joseph's sons. Now, we won't get into the weeds on this. If you want a refresher on that, you can go back to my message from last April 3rd. Uh, perhaps if I remember to do this in the edited version that goes up later, I'll try and remember to put a little uh, link up in the top so that you could go to that if you want to. Uh, these were all people who were marked with the seal of God, according to Revelation 7. And here at the beginning of chapter 14, we find out what was in that seal, what that seal contained. This is Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw the Lamb, that's Jesus, standing on Mount Zion. Now, historically, this was the place of deliverance, though in this case, it's probably not the physical Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It's more likely the heavenly Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So that seal from Revelation 7 contained the name of the Father and of the Lamb, in contrast to those who had the mark of the beast in chapter 13. Verse 2, And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of mighty ocean waves or the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. Now commonly, the roar of a mighty ocean or loud thunder is symbolic for the voice of God. So this scene has changed dramatically, hasn't it? We've gone from a beast arising from the sea and a beast arising from the earth commanding the worship of the beast arising from the sea and all these people being marked with the number of that beast. Cue the thunder and the lightning and the drama. 
to the sound now of God's voice and heavenly harps. Now we needed Liz Brown here to go do with her harp. The sound of many harpists would be more like a heavenly choir of worshipers, as verse 3 says. This great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. This uh, would be the Lamb's victory song as this army had overcome the world. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb. They have told no lies. They are without blame. Now that word redeemed and the word purchased come from the same root. It's the Greek word agorazo, and I don't tell you that to impress you with my knowledge of ancient Greek, so much as to say that you'll probably know where that word uh, serves as a, as a root for an English term, and that is, it's the term from which we get the word agoraphobia, that is, the fear of crowds or open spaces. So agorazo, redeemed or purchased. Uh, it's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, in which he says that the church has been bought with a price. They have been purchased and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. John describes them as a special offering, literally first fruits. This is sacrificial language, so it's likely that these were martyred for their faith. In ancient Greek culture, some documents even refer to people as first fruits when they are offered to God or to a God as a temple servant. Verse 5 says that they tell no lies and they are without blame. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13, the first part of it says this The remnant of Israel will do no wrong, they will never tell lies or deceive one another. To be without blame is to lack any blemish, also a sacrificial notion, though in this case the meaning is to lack ethical blemish. So what we have here is a vision John receives from the Lord that, as I've said before, would have made perfect sense to the first readers and hearers of the book of Revelation. And it is the description of disciples, followers of Jesus, that it gives us here. What about that 144,000 number, though? Does this mean, as the Jehovah's Witnesses say, that there will only be 144,000 people in heaven? I don't think so. Because after all, why would Jesus give the Great Commission to go and make more disciples if in fact there was going to be a, a limited number of people in heaven? Again, it's not a precise number, right? 144,000 is 12 times 12 times 1,000. That is, the tribes of Israel times the disciples of Jesus, times a great big number. So this 144,000 symbolizes the entire faithful remnant of the church, Jewish and Gentile in background, and a whole lot of them who have held fast to the Lord despite great persecution. The division between chapters 13 and 14 sort of creates a line in the sand between those who have the name of the Father and of the Lamb written on them and those who have the mark of the beast written on them. And this is why I often shake my head at followers of Jesus who get so wrapped up in making sure that they don't get the mark of the beast on them. Because if, if they're truly followers of Jesus, then they have the name of the Father and of the Lamb on them, and these are mutually exclusive. If you truly have given your life to Jesus as Savior and Lord and are serving him with a full heart, none of that can ever be taken from you. So why get wrapped up in whether or not it's okay to have a social insurance number or use UPC codes or get your picture on your driver's license? I mean, these are all matters I've heard some Christians fight vigorously. When that seal contains not some number, but the name of the Father and of the Lamb. Now, I don't expect that's an issue for any of you here today or watching from home, because chances are, if you're that way inclined, you already unsubscribed or left a while ago. 
it last Sunday certainly would have frustrated you, I'm quite sure. So what we have here is a cryptic, as so much of Revelation is, a cryptic statement about what constitutes a disciple of Jesus. And there are three basic characteristics, so track with me on this. First, there's the name. This symbolic throng of 144,000 had the name of the Lamb and of the Father written on their foreheads in stark contrast to those who were unfaithful and idolatrous and had the mark of the beast written on their foreheads. If the name of Jesus is displayed on us, we should be expected to live it out. Whenever someone is wearing some sort of a symbol, especially if it's a tattoo, I like to ask the person about it. After all, if it's on public display, then they're probably not going to be ashamed to talk about it. Last week, I was having lunch with a couple of colleagues on a presbytery matter, and as the waitress came to take our order, I noticed that she had a little squiggle tattooed uh, on her arm just above her wrist. And so I decided to say, you know, tell me about the squiggle on your arm. And she smiled and showed me that on the opposite part of her arm was tattooed the word gratitude. So what I actually called a squiggle, a squiggle was actually a, a, a wave, uh, something that was more obvious when it was pointed out. She said that she had visited Florida, and as she watched the ocean waves come in, she was overwhelmed with gratitude to God for all the blessings that he had given to her, and that tattoo became a reminder of that. So in one sense, that squiggle was a witness, and I was glad I asked about it. Often it's more obvious though, right? I remember wearing a hat I got from the Ontario Northland Railway, and I was once asked if I worked for the ONR, and I said, no, I'm just a fan. I, I, it wasn't an unreasonable conclusion for the person to come to though. So let me ask you this, what name are you advertising for with your life? Are you in the Lord's army, or are you just a fan? So far in my life, I've yet to see a person with my own eyes who has had 666, or the name of the Father and the Lamb, physically marked on their forehead. But I have been able to guess at times by a person's actions, or a person's language, or a person's demeanor, which mark that person might have if it could be seen. Not to say that believers don't from time to time sin uh, and fail to live up to the name, but over time, we can usually tell which team somebody's batting for. So our discipleship is characterized by the name of Jesus written, perhaps not on our foreheads, but in our actions and our lifestyle. That's not to say that our actions earn us that place as disciples, right? Instead, they prove that we are disciples. Second, our place as disciples is characterized by purity. The first part of verse 4 says, They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the Lamb wherever he goes. Now, in days of yore, some people would have said that this was a proof text for celibacy among clergy. But John is using virginity here both as simile and metaphor, saying that this throng of disciples kept themselves as pure as virgins, pure like virgins. But he's not talking about physical celibacy or virginity as much as he is talking about spiritual faithfulness. That is, disciples are characterized by their purity as people who had remained faithful to the Lamb and not given in to worshipping the Emperor or any of the other gods of the Roman pantheon. It was in this sense that Israel and the Church are presented in Scripture as virgins. They have remained pure in their allegiance to the Lord. Applying that to today, then, uh, we would say that disciples remain faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel and not to the gods of our day, gods like money or power or identity or politics and so many others. It all sounds like a complicated way of saying, be true to the Lord. But that's essentially what it was. Remember, John wrote cryptically because if he'd written plainly, it would only have accelerated the senseless murder of Christians that was taking place in that time. And as I said last week, God's people in our time 
cannot indulge in divided interests. Either we have the mark of the beast or the name of the lamb. There is no in-between. We can't be followers of Jesus on Sunday and followers of something else the rest of the week. It's all or nothing. So disciples have the name of the Lamb and of the Father marked on them, and they are pure, undivided in their allegiance to the Lord because he has redeemed them. And third, this passage tells us that disciples are blameless. Look again at verse 5. It says, They have told no lies. They are without blame. They stand in contrast to the world's liars who slander believers. Back in Revelation 3.9, in the letter to the church at Philadelphia, Jesus makes reference to a synagogue of Satan, referring to the unbelievers who were speaking lies about the church. Disciples are not into propaganda. They tell the truth of the gospel, and they renounce all idols at all costs. Disciples distinguish themselves from the world and value what matters to God. Again, as I said last week, look at your bank statement to get a picture of what you value. And let me say this, it's hard, right? It's hard. Disentangling ourselves from the world can at times feel like trying to dry yourself off while you're treading water. You just get one part dry and suddenly it's wet again. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. You can't do this on your own. You can't stand apart from the world's values without divine intervention. And that's why Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit when he ascended to the Father. Every day we need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us afresh. Make it your first thought, your first prayer of the day. Holy Spirit, come, fill me anew. And then when the Holy Spirit seeks to help you through your day, don't ignore that help, right? It's easy to ask the Holy Spirit to come, and then when the Holy Spirit comes, you say, no, 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 not right now. No, that's not the way it works. You invite the Holy Spirit, and you welcome the Holy Spirit. You plead for the Holy Spirit. This great throng, this huge multitude of followers of Jesus of both Jewish and Gentile background, this metaphorical 144,000, these are people who have the name of the Lamb and of the Father on their foreheads. These are people who are pure and faithful in their allegiance to the Lamb and to the Father. These are people who are blameless, embracing the truth of the gospel and renouncing all idols. This is a picture of Christian discipleship in a hostile world. The world was a hostile place for God's people when John wrote Revelation. Governments demanded complete uh, allegiance and even worship. Citizens thought Christians were weird and even quaint, maybe, for their adherence to worshiping one God. Does that sound familiar? Western civilization, if we dare call it that anymore, was a safe place for followers of Jesus for most of the last 1,700 years. That's a long time. And the church in many places grew weak and complacent. But sisters and brothers, now is the time to rise from our complacency. Now is the time to stand up for the gospel. Now is the time to call on the Holy Spirit to fill the church and empower her people daily for faithful living. Now is the time to witness for the truth so that more people will give their lives to Jesus, adding daily to that metaphorical 144,000, that vast throng of people. Let us go into the world as those who have been purchased from among the people of the earth as a special offering to God and to the Lamb, who paid the price to set us apart. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we need your Holy Spirit to fill us and equip us for this monumental task of being your faithful people. Fill us anew, we pray. Breathe on us, breath of God. 
Give us strength and resolve to live as those with the name of the Lamb and of the Father inscribed upon us. Give us patience with those who think we are strange. Give us joy when we are tempted to wallow in our sorrows. And help us to lean on each other, sisters and brothers in Christ, that we will go from strength to strength as your faithful army, ready to claim the crown that Jesus has won for us. We ask this in his name. Amen. If you called out for the Holy Spirit to fill you for the task of being a disciple of Jesus today, please let me know about it so I can pray for you. Uh, hit me up on the connection card at stpaulsnobleton.ca slash connect, and I would be honored uh, to know that we are fighting this battle together.